Everyone, thank you for watching, and this is Bruce Muffson, LCSW from Sunridge of Nevada. We had topics that we were going to bring up today uh, related to a series of mental health, as we always do, but the last week has been, last three, four days have been so disruptive and has caught the attention of everyone in America that we felt it was a waste of time to do that and, and a disservice. We want to talk about what happened with Alton Sterling, Philandro Castile, and what happened in Dallas, Texas. And I want to break it down to you clinically, and we're not going to worry in the sense of, you know, time frame, format. We want to discuss this on a clinical level. Our videos are about prevention, about saving lives, about keeping you safe from harm's way. And the death of these two men and the death of those officers in Dallas and the, and the wounded was such a shocking event that I felt and we both felt, the people involved in this production of this program, that not to talk about this would be a disservice. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to break down, in my opinion, clinically, what happened with the shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, and also put the context of the shootings in Dallas, Texas, in a reference point so some clarity of what took place and what happened. Here we go. Now, what I'm going to do is, normally I've done before, as those of you who have watched this, these videos, I take a you know, I take a rap video, I take something, um, a movie, and I break it down clinically. I'm going to do the same thing now with the video that I had seen repeatedly for Alton Sterling and Philandro, and I'm going to break those down. And I'm going to start off with Alton, and here we go. For those, the millions of you, tens of millions of you, that have watched this video repeatedly, here are the points I wanted to clarify from a clinical perspective. If you notice when it was going on, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring in some back points. I did some reading up. There's been so much stuff coming out on almost like an hourly basis. The question was, when you see the officers, you, what, what I understand was there was yelling and screaming. When you're dealing with a situation, you want to look at it as, what is the purpose of yelling and screaming? What is that going to accomplish? And is it going to be effective? And then the question was, why tackle him? When you put hands on somebody, anytime you do that, you are taking things into jeopardy. Things become unknown. As someone who's worked in the mental health field for over 20 years, I can tell you from experience, I've been involved in hundreds if not thousands of takedowns from violent patients. When you do that, that is your biggest chance for getting hurt, you and the patient. That's why they teach you now in so many times, the last 10, 15 years, not to put hands on people, to do talk therapy, to do de-escalation if possible. Now, there are times you have to put hands on people, absolutely, but that has become an issue of last resort. Then you have two on him, okay? He's a big guy. Putting two people on a big person, you can see how they're positioned with their feet on him and their knees on him, they were not even in a position to control the situation. So he is also looking up at them, which if you do any kind of takedown work, they tell you the person has to be facing downward to get total control. But two people do a takedown, they tell you unless it's absolutely necessary, you never do a two-person takedown because it's dangerous and it puts you at a great deal of risk. Also, his arms were pinned. So he didn't have a chance when the officers are yelling, he has a gun, he has a gun. How could he use a weapon of any type, even though what I'm understanding was a weapon was recovered from his pants pocket, there was no access to a gun. And also what we say when we do takedowns, we have a lead person in charge and we automatically say, is there anything on this person that could be dangerous to us? You assess a situation before you make any kind of movement. So you shoot him four times also. And I understand that he was tasered first. They slammed him, I'm sorry, they slammed him against the car and then they tasered him. What happened after the taser? Was the taser effective? Could they have used it again? What made them think to believe that the taser was not effective in the first place? And what other non-lethal approaches could they have used? Excuse me, sir, we have a situation that we want to know, do you have a gun on you? Is there, you know, are you, are you aggressive? Are you angry at somebody? We're first going and talk to the shop owner who according to reports let this man stay in his, in his parking lot and sell CDs for years and tapes without any kind of problem. So go first to the person whose property he's on and see is there a problem here? Is there an issue here? Is there a concern here? 
Anything that you can do to de-escalate. When I walk into a house and do assessments, for instance, I'm not comparing myself at all to what a police officer goes through on the pops on a daily basis, but I have to learn to be very sensitive to the area I'm in, to the surroundings, to how people are looking at me emotionally, clinically. Just last night, I went to do an assessment. I couldn't complete it because things were so disruptive in the home that I realized for me to stay any longer was not doing the client or the, pa or the family any good. I left. De-escalate. Was I upset? Was I annoyed? Was I angry? Of course I was. But I couldn't be out of control. I have to maintain control by my actions, by my presence, by my physicality. So now we're getting reports that before we saw what we saw in the 38 seconds of that video is that the officers slammed him against the car, then they tased him before grabbing onto him and shooting him. So once again, you're putting hands on people without ever ascertaining where was the gun. If the whole issue is where is the gun, tactically you got to think to yourself, I want to get that gun secured on some level. Where is that gun? And also, who's in charge? You don't get a sense at all of the two officers who really is in charge, who's calling the shots. Anytime a takedown is done in a hospital setting, what you do is you have a lead person whose directions you follow. He's the only person that gives commands, only person that gives voice signals, because a takedown is a very scary situation. I've seen people get their knees hurt, knees busted, uh, elbows, neck, shoulder, be on disability for months, if not for life, because of a poorly designed takedown. And this is with people hopefully without a gun or a knife. So just imagine doing that with somebody who has a weapon of that kind of nature, I'd be even more frightened, even more afraid, and make sure I'm doing everything by the book for safety-wise, not just for myself, but for the potential victim as well, or the person that I might be wrestling with on the floor that could possibly injure or kill me. Now, the store owner said he was allowed to use the area outside the store to sell his CDs, and he'd been doing that for years. So it wasn't like this was a person that he didn't know, or set up shop like three days ago, or threatened the storekeeper that you better let me do this or else. He was someone that he knew. He said he was a low-key guy. He was not aggressive. He carried a gun, yes, but as he said, because of the nature of that business, which was cash only, he was carrying it for protection because he didn't want to get ripped off. So ironically, a person who was in a sense a business owner of some type was killed because he was actually worried about his business model and keeping it going. So he was nervous, so this was in his own way, like his store protection was having a weapon on him. So once again, you have to think to yourself, how was the situation handled? And leading to the 911 call, which I heard repeatedly, you realize how poor the information was coming in. So when you get to the store, you have to say, hey, partner, before we do anything, let's roll up, talk to the store owner, let's be tactical about this, let's give ourselves some distance, let's say to the guy, sir, if you have a weapon, can you please take it out of your pocket, throw it to us, throw it to the ground, take out the bullets, we don't want any trouble, and then we want to talk to you, we want to secure the weapon, then we want to talk to you. I don't know if his size intimidated the officers, but get as much information as you can before you make this kind of decision. And once you're struggling with somebody on top of them, that is the most dangerous place to be. And you never want to have the person staring up at you. You want the person face down. Why? It's calmer. When the person is face down, you have the arms and legs pinned, not the back. You never, you're told never to go on somebody's back or on somebody's chest because you can kill them. You can asphyxiate them. You can break ribs that you're told now never, ever, ever have your knees on someone's chest or on someone's back because that's how they die. Plus, he was a big guy. This guy was overweight. Someone like that has a, is going to have a problem with if there's pressure on his stomach or on his chest, he's going to have a harder time to breathe, very quickly likely to pass out, become unconscious, go into cardiac arrest, and die. So that's what I wanted to bring out clinically about Alton Sterling and how it was handled, and the lack of training, the lack of street awareness, the lack of any kind of communication skills, and the inability to make a good decision before rolling up. And there's no need to act spontaneously, unless he was, wait, look, obviously, 
He's waving a gun around and he's shooting at people. You have to do something in that second. We understand that. But if things are low key, stay low key. Don't go into overdrive if you don't have to. I want to clarify that about Alton. And again, our hearts go out to his family. Again, I saw the video of his son crying, of his wife crying. It, it, it was horrible. You know, to see, to see the tears coming out, it, you know, the family crying and, and hysterical, it was dreadful. And just some comments here is he said, in talking to Abdullah Mulfahi, he was, this was a store owner, he said no one was waving a gun, certainly not Sterling. He, as he says, he didn't even tell me about anything. He usually tells me. He's not that type of person. It would have been a very big problem to pull his gun out. And as he says, he says there was no altercation, as police claimed, until the cops tasered and tackled Sterling. That's when he took out his phone and started recording. So my question again becomes, how did they approach it? Did they approach it properly? And that goes back to, again, training, training, training to understand what you're doing when you're in this kind of situation. Okay, now I want to turn to Philando Castile. I mean, I saw the video myself multiple times, and it was dreadful to see this person literally dying, body covered in blood, and as you could see him, like, basically you could hear him dying. You could hear him groaning as he's near death. Now, he was stopped for a broken taillight with a girlfriend and a four-year-old child. Now, the, the girlfriend had incredible presence of mind to be able to do what she did on Facebook and actually capture the whole scene as best as she could. He was asked for license and registration. He said in wallet, he said, she said it's in his wallet, license to carry. Officer said, don't move. And then his hands were going up because he said, I want to see your hands. And instead of going for the registration in the back, the officer shot him. Now, in watching the video, you see a complete lack of control by the officer in handling the situation. You're coming up on a traffic light stop. Okay, broken tail light, traffic light. It's, I'm sorry, not tra it's a traffic stop, broken tail light. You have a man, a woman, and a four-year-old in the back seat. It's unlikely that he's going to do anything of a dangerous nature with his girlfriend and her four-year-old daughter in the car. It's not realistic. Broke, now, you're going in for a broken taillight. You're not suspecting that he's carrying drugs. You're not suspecting that he's carrying weapons or that he has a body in the trunk. It's a broken taillight. And you have a four-year-old child in the car, and there's no suspicious activity that he's noting as he's walking to the car. And when he's saying like this, like, you know, put your hands up, what is the mindset right then and there? I've lost control of the situation. I've pulled my Glock out, I'm holding it at this person, and I'm already making the assumption that he's a dangerous person. Yet he has a four-year-old girl in the back seat, and he has a girlfriend saying, basically, hey baby, keep it calm, keep it calm, keep it calm. Why did the officer have to make that implied assumption that this was gonna go south even before it started? That's what doesn't make any sense. And he's so nervous, he's so nervous, the officer, that he's pointing his gun in a situation that almost begs for it to be fired. When you, when you have your weapon like this, cocked and loaded, ready to fire, so already you're making the assumption that anything is going to happen, probably negatively, therefore I fear for my life and I have to protect myself. And again, as the girlfriend said, he's licensed to carry, the gun was probably in the glove compartment, and he has his license of registration in his wallet that he keeps in his back pocket. For me, I keep it in my side pocket. I'm not a back pocket guy, but I know plenty of guys that keep their wallet registration in their back pocket. They're more comfortable with it in the back pocket. It's everyone's individual preference. So in watching the video, you never get a sense that the officer is in control of the situation. There's none of this, there's not even like, you don't get, well, now we're not seeing the whole video, of course, but you don't get a sense as like, Hey, where are you coming from? What kind of job do you have? Make conversation. Get a read on what's going on. Oh, is this your daughter? She's very cute. Where does she go to school? Sir, you have a broken taillight. How did it go from broken taillight to being shot multiple times in the arm that this young man bleeds to death 
when on no level, on any level, was he any type of criminal behavior that would warrant what happened. It doesn't make any sense. Now, here's where it gets peculiar, is that he shot, and the officer is still holding the Glock in through the window at the woman now, essentially, at the girlfriend, and you don't hear any radio call from the breast, like right here where the mic is, get EMS, get an ambulance. I shot somebody. You don't even see the officer trying to pull this guy out of the car and start to perform chest compressions with CPR, maybe giving him a few more minutes of life till the evidence arrives to say, oh my God, I made a mistake, I screwed up. Let me pull this guy out, put him on the street, put him on the sidewalk. Where were the breaths? And then as the other officers are coming, there's no attempt said, I don't hear anyone yelling, get an ambulance, get an ambulance, get an ambulance, get an ambulance. Instead they say to the girlfriend, turn around, walk backwards, get to your knees, not like come to a bench and sit down, you have to be in shock and your four-year-old daughter needs to be sitting with you because she has to be in shock. I can only imagine what that four-year-old is going to be going through the rest of her life. Instead, it's get on your knees, we're cuffing you, and we're putting you back in a car. There's no offer to get her water, no offer to get her ambulance help, no offer to have her daughter sitting next to her right away. Instead, there's a separation of this fear factor that no one is taking into account the needs of the victim. Where was that? And even the governor who was watching the video, Governor Dayton, said, it did not show any attempt by the officers making an effort to provide first aid. As he made a comment, he said, he goes, the stark treatment I find just absolutely appalling on all, at all levels. He said the video did not show officers making any attempt to render first aid to the dying man, but they handcuffed Miss Reynolds and placed her and her daughter in the back of a police car. That was the name of the woman, the name of the girlfriend. And the problem you're looking at is, where was the thinking? Where was the process? So you do this. You pile on wood, you pile on wood, you pile on wood, you pour on gasoline, you pour on gasoline, and then you come to Dallas. And it's almost a given that there was going to be some kind of like, quote, quote, payback or riot using the guise of a peaceful rally to take the lives of officers and wound civilians. It was almost a given. When I was hearing last night, as I was driving home on the radio, there's rioting breaking out, there's shooting in Dallas, there's a siege going on. I thought, of course, why wouldn't there be? You create the deaths of two people, you create the spark so when you have a person that says, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of the situation. I'm ex-military. I'm armed to the teeth. I want to hurt people. Well, who better to hurt than police officers in a completely different neighborhood, completely different state, completely different city, and blast people away, including people that were attending the march? How insane is that? And you realize the, the craziness of it all. Two men are killed, a rally takes place in Dallas, Texas, not in Louisiana, not in, not in Minnesota, and you literally have a bloodbath. Because this person is taking a high-powered weapon and firing, well, deliberately trying to kill police officers, and also trying to kill marchers, who were there for peaceful reasons. Because violence begets violence. Anger begets anger. And this is the problem. And there was an article that, I was, that was given to me that was very interesting. So you have five officers killed and seven injured because of what happened last night. And the nation is still reeling from this. And there's an article written by Kay Wright, K-A-I-W-R-I-G-H-T. And she had a question, you know, and then she talked about what happened with the, with the, you know, with the death of these two people. 
And she made this comment, and she goes like this. We need to start asking what is her opinion, why we have so much law enforcement in the first place, and whether much of it is truly needed. She said like this, she says, local law enforcement agencies, law enforcement agencies are among the largest and most powerful bureaucracies in most localities. And they are deeply enmeshed in our daily lives, particularly in communities of color. It's very true. I mean, to get mental health people to go to underserved populations is few and far in between. Very few people want to do it. Particularly going into houses and homes of people of color where it's not often a pristine situation, where it's not a clean situation. She goes, they are our first responders, they are in our schools, they are immigration officers, and for the most vulnerable among us, they are often what passes for social workers and mental health care providers. And they are armed. I'm not. And at some point, we must question whether all this law enforcement is necessary and whether public safety is best served by having much, much less of it. That's her opinion. And you have to ask yourself again, had there been better training dealing with Alton and Philando, could Dallas have been prevented? And my answer is yes. And all the videos that we're doing is about prevention, about awareness, about social understanding of other people, other ethnicities, other, you know, segments of the population that may inspire dread, fear, nervousness. And to realize we're all one color, one people, and we're all created in the image of God. But our response to situations that don't have to escalate continue to be a problem that the devil America and force us to look at ourselves and say, what are we accomplishing? Even President Obama, you know, I, I, it's like he even, even he said, he was, he's over in Warsaw today, he's dealing with NATO, and he made a comment that there's problems with biases in the Justice Department, in our justice system, but at the same time, he, he, he was appalled at what happened in Dallas. So it's not like he was like, oh, payback, good, great. He was horrified by what happened. To see five innocent officers killed in the line of duty and these civilians wounded with their trauma they're going to have for the rest of their lives, he said, of course it's insane. But at the same time, we have to look at ourselves and say, what is our problem that routine situations involving interactions lead to death? Death, not like handcuffs or a fine or a ticket. We got to ask ourselves that question. And when I talk to people who are African American, you know, my age or younger, their response to me is when they're stopped, their assumption is this could be the last time they're going to be alive. Simply for the fact of their color, of their ethnicity, of the situation that they realize that they have no control over and this could lead to their demise. A simple thing of being pulled over for a broken light, broken tail light. That's scary. I've had broke, you know, honestly, I remember, God, back in another lifetime, I had a broken tail light. I was stopped by a police officer, and what did he say to me? You need to fix it. Move on. I could not imagine that Philando would be dead and his girlfriend basically trying to hold it together, seeing her boyfriend's body blood soaked and screaming that he's dead and she's on her knees being cuffed. Go, just go fix it. That was it. So today's video is meant to be you know, somber, reflective, to be thinking. And we're not here to bash law enforcement. We're not here to make this a racial issue. That's not the point. The point is to look at ourselves deeper. And, and, and these two deaths could have been prevented. That's the point. Dallas didn't have to have the march if you didn't have the two earlier incidents. And I often talk about that. How one thing leads to another, leads to another, till boom, it bursts. It has to get its energy out. That's how you have these situations occur. 
And if these officers who clearly were poorly trained, poorly led, and had no real understanding of what they were doing when they were approaching the situation, it could have looked, it could have been handled a lot better. And I'm just going to close. I, I was listening to a radio show on Hot 97 where the DJ got in, you know, very upset, very angry, where he was saying to a police officer that had called in, at what point do you say we made a mistake? We need to grow from this. We need to learn from this. How could it always be like an excuse where you didn't see the full story? That's your version. That's the angle of the video. He says, what point do you take responsibility? And here's my la and here's my closing. Until we get to that point that we can accept responsibility for our failures, for our mistakes, for our inadequacies, these situations, unfortunately, 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 are going to continue to happen, and innocent people who are not meant to be killed are going to be victims and will be killed. And that's the biggest tragedy of all. Thank you.